Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. All right, good morning, everybody. If we could please come to order. This is the January 6, 2020, 9 a.m. meeting of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners. I'm board chair, Amy Gailey, and with us today we have Commissioner Sutton, Commissioner Boswell, Commissioner Lashley, and Vice Commissioner Carter. Vice Chair Carter, excuse me. <laughs> Beg your pardon. It's just um, vice. Yeah. I'm in charge of that, right? Okay. Uh, uh, Vice Chair Carter has the invocation today. If you would lead us in that and the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Call me in prayer. Father God, as we approach you this morning, dear Lord, we approach you with humility, seeking your grace and mercy, seeking the power of your wisdom and knowledge, and courage, dear Lord, to handle the business of our community, our county. We ask, Father God, that you be with all of us, that you make our deliberations straight, strong, that you help us to do the right thing for our citizens and for us. We ask, Father God, for your presence with all those who are joined here today and keep us all safe and sound as we move about the rest of our week. We ask, Father God, for all these things in the powerful and holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Regarding our public comment period, you each speaker gets three minutes. Um, we have one person signed up today. No, two people signed up today. Thank you, pardon for agenda related items. The first is Mr. Henry Vines. Henry Good morning, Good morning everyone. Good morning. My name is Henry Vines, and you all know I'm from Snow Camp. Uh, I've come this morning to speak to you about uh, the proposal of the jail. Uh, I think that this cost is really just too high. Done a little research, and uh, the average cost is about a hundred and twenty-five dollars to three hundred and sixty-three dollars a square foot for to build a, a jail cell. That's what they figure on, you know, uh, per square foot. Our proposal that we're proposing to do is. Eight hundred eighty thousand dollars, which comes up to about five hundred eighty-six thousand uh, five hundred eighty-six dollars per square foot. Uh, if you add the hundred and twenty-five thousand in there for the architect, that'll bring it up to six hundred and seventy dollars a square foot. Um, I don't know that. Um, I know what the pro proposal is that we want to utilize this land, and I understand that. <coughs> And if the need there is for additional beds, I mean, I certainly understand that. But I think that maybe this is just cost prohibitive. You know, maybe this is not where we need to go uh, when you're looking at that kind of money. And I mean, you're looking at you could drop back to the middle of those ranges to two two hundred and fifty dollars uh, per square foot and build a facility and get twice the amount. This is only for fifteen hundred square feet. That's not much square footage at all. Um, I think if we need to add these additional beds, I mean, why don't we utilize the prison unit down there? Go in there and spend this million dollars and upgrade that facility down there, which has uh, a lot more capacity down there that's not being utilized. And that would be something that we could look into as an alternative. I would ask you respectively that you would look at this and open this thing back up again for more discussion. I know that um, y'all voted on some of this stuff earlier and um, but when these numbers came down uh, it just was kind of shocking to me and also uh, the uh, architect general fees usually is between eight 
and 15 percent and if you figure what this is i mean that's at the high end that's the 15 to 16 percent of the of the eight hundred eighty thousand dollars so i would just uh, ask you to reopen this and revisit this and certainly go with the sheriff here and and uh, let's try to accommodate what we need but i think we could do it in a much more cost efficient way uh tearing this building down may just not be really uh cost prohibitive thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. All right, Ann Yes. Hello, commissioners. Um, I speak today also out of a concern uh, about the proposed 126000 for the jail expansion, but uh, from a different perspective. Uh, while we don't want overcrowding in our jails, uh, with Judge Lambeth and others exploring changes in our cash <coughs> bail system, this does not seem like the time for expansion. And I ask you to wait on that review and consider the number of people innocent until proven guilty who simply cannot afford bail and are in our jail. Only those who are a danger to others or flight risk should be held before convicted. According to Forbes a magazine, 70% of Americans do not have $1,000 in savings. Most of us live paycheck to paycheck and could be at risk of losing our jobs, our housing, hurting our family and our children because we do not have the money to get out of jail before trial. I ask you to hesitate for another reason to consider what effect no exercise yard has on the mental, spiritual, and physical state of people in prison, sometimes for over a year. No time under the sky or in the <coughs> sun, this is inhumane. It does Alamance County no good to be known as a jail town, especially not one where people fleeing violence and hunger in their home country are held captive for profit. I want this county to be known as a great community and for its humanity. The U.S. has more people who are incarcerated and the highest rate of incarceration in the world. And many citizens want to see this plot on our nation reversed. Is this the time to get behind prison expansion? Can't we invest our money more wisely? Thank you, Ms. Castlebaum. Um, we will be addressing that, this, the issues about the um, jail renovation project when we reach that in the agenda. But does anybody have anything they want to say? Any commissioner responses to those at this time? If not, then. Uh, if everybody has had the opportunity to review the agenda, we could have a motion to approve the agenda. I move. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the agenda. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, we have a few items on the consent agenda. Actually, one item on the consent agenda. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, the first uh, business before the board today with uh, presentations and so forth is a report about the um, closed Swepsonville landfill. I believe Bruce Walker. Oh, here you are. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to introduce that item. So, um, why are we here? We have an old Swepsonville landfill south of Swepsonville on the corner of Swepsonville, Sykes Bull Road, and Alfred Road closed in 1993. The old, normal, uh, the old normal was for years we were on the state's 1993 agreed upon path for the closed old landfill to be passive and low-level monitoring. Adjacent residential wells have been testing fine for years by the health department and continues to do so. New normal, new rules, new regulations, new testing equipment, um, and new emerging chemicals to look out for. The state is doing this review for every old landfill in the state. We now, uh, we now have a state approved plan moving forward for managing the closed landfill at Swepsonville with all these new rules and regulations. Our experts, Maddie German and Dr. Steve Gandy are here from Municipal Engineering and are gonna go over the spe specifics of our plan, some challenges, 
a few maps to talk about some of the new emergency chemicals that everybody throughout the state is testing for now. This is the new normal moving forward. Thank you all for having me this morning. I hope everyone enjoyed a nice weekend. My name is Maddie German. I'm a geologist with Municipal Engineering. I have been working on the Swepsonville Landfill Project, so I'm just kind of going to bring you up to date a little summary of the history of the landfill, where what, what we've done to this point, and what we're looking at doing moving forward. So as, as Bruce said, the Swepsonville landfill, uh, you started accepting waste possibly as early as 1971. That's the earliest date that we found. Um, it was filled in five sections with one vertical expansion. Uh, the last section, section five, was closed pre-subtitle D regulations in about 1993. Everything was closed in accordance with the regulations for the landfill closure at that time. Since about 1992, you guys have been doing consistent groundwater monitoring for, for all the parameters that the solid waste section has requested and any time that they have changed those parameters over the course of your monitoring history, you have complied with the solid waste section's requests. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Swepsonville landfill, this is the map of your landfill. The pink is the property boundary that um, is, is owned by the county. The sort of divided up areas on the left hand side are the different areas that have been filled. On the right hand side across of Haw Creek, that area has never been used for disposal. It's completely virgin land. I think there's possibility of maybe timbering it. It's just nice and forested land. So before I get into a little bit more about the details, I wanted to just kind of provide you guys with a high level summary about groundwater concentrations and, and a little bit of the laboratory sampling, what we're kind of looking at. So parts per million, when you hear about this level, that's if you hear like a big spill or a big cleanup, it's about an inch and 16 miles. So that's the concentration level that they're, they're looking at. And parts per billion, that's the area that is kind of our playground right now. That's the area that most of our analysis takes place. We look at data in there. Most of your concentration limits and standards are in the parts per billion range. And that's about one second in 32 years. So if you're thinking about what size we're looking down to, that's how small we get. And then parts per trillion, that's that's like the up and comer. The technology is getting better and better, better. The labs can look a little bit tinier and tinier. And as we start finding more things and hearing about different stuff that the chemical companies are doing, this is starting to become more and more of a, 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 a term that we're using. Um, and that's about a six inch leap on the journey to the sun, which is 90, about 93 million miles. So six inches and 93 million miles is parts per trillion. So that's, that's how tiny we could possibly get. So that's just to give you some perspective at the levels of stuff that we're looking <coughs> at. So in June of 2018, Alamance County received a letter from the solid waste section saying that you have some concentrations of chemicals that are over some of your 2L standards. Since then, there's been a number of meetings at both just the county and local level, as well as with the solid waste section, to kind of go over plans and actions and address <coughs> what we're going to do in relationship to, to these concentrations. One of the first things we did was we went out and we put in some wells. And then we sampled those wells, and we've sampled uh, Lots of the surface water, you guys have plenty of surface water around that site, so we've sampled a lot of the surface waters around the site as well. We've also gone out and done a receptor survey of all the neighboring roads and looking, looked for potential wells and, and receptors. And the 
county has been doing residential well monitoring for residences between um, off 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 Alfred Road, off Swap Saps Road, and uh, we did an additional one as part of this study. We'll get into that a little bit more, and. Um, We've had some preliminary discussions with the Army Corps of Engineers as well as the Division of <coughs> Water Resources. In the spring and April of 2019, we submitted our initial report to the Division of Waste Management to Solid Waste Section, and they had a couple reservations about not having deep wells, so we'll probably go back in and put some deep wells in on the landfill property. Um, this is kind of a tricky situation with the deep wells, and the reason we initially didn't want to install them is because it's, they're very tricky to install. And because we have some of these chemicals in the uppermost aquifer, we have to drill through them. So there's a potential that we could do more harm than good by installing these, wall, these wells. So we felt that the harm was not worth the risk, however, the solid waste section disagreed, so we're going to put them in anyway, and we're going to do our very, very best to make sure that we cover all the bases, so no matter what we're doing, hopefully the worst case scenario does not happen. When you say the solid waste section, that's mm -hmm. the state. That's the state. So the state of North Carolina said that they wanted right. that to be done. Well, that wasn't coming Right, so the Environmental county. Quality Division of Waste Management solid waste section is like the <coughs> compartment, the department, and the whole uh, state. That's that's who, that's who we converse with the most. Well, the, the argument about drilling through existing aquifer down to the deeper aquifer and contaminating one from the other, that makes a whole lot of sense. Why do they not see that? They are in their, from, from what I understand from them, their perspective is that it's, it's a risk worth taking to confirm that it's not gone down that it's not in the bedrock aquifer, because there's a lot of rock in this part of the state, so we, we hit rock in some of your locations pretty shallow. And they feel like because there's that potential that there's so much rock here, they just want to know for sure. I mean, they would rather you go on the neighbor's properties, but we didn't feel like that was the appropriate. And the wealth of science at the front door. <laughs> Um, but but that's that's what they've requested and they were they were pretty adamant that they wanted that so we felt like it's something that we can do and we have made as many preparations as possible and are working very closely with the drillers and they understand this is a very sensitive issue so it's going to be handled with white gloves well, as much as we, we can. the deep wells on, in the area that hasn't been used for landfill would that be an appropriate <coughs> direction to go so that you're not going through landfill space? Well, the way that the landfill is situated, basically the whole side that has been used for landfilling, you've covered almost the entire property right. to the property boundary. So, so they want you to go through that, not through space we haven't used. So we're gonna go through space we haven't used. Okay. We, have, we have probably 100 feet of buffer in some of these areas, but <laughs> it's not a lot, but um, that's just a function of the way that things used to be set up. Um, with Subtitle D room rules, we build in a lot more space so that you have to leave a lot more space between the edge of where you fill and your property line. Right. But pre-Subtitle D, you could basically fill almost up to your property line. And everyone did because they just, they used the whole footprint. They, that was, they had less information than we have right. today. So it's hard to look back with today's information at what they knew and how they were going about it. They were doing the best they could because with the information they had. So now we're just trying to go about where can we get a well that's still in Alamance County property. And if we went on the other side of the creek, right. sure, it would be fine, but it, it wouldn't give us any useful information. Okay. Maybe it would be good to go on with your presentation and tell us where the wells are that you've been looking at. Okay, we'll just keep on going. Okay, so this is the receptor monitoring. So I thought that was kind of the most important. So on the left side of the landfill, there's 
five properties that you guys have been monitoring for about 30 years. The environmental health has been sampling their wells routinely. They're on an annual monitoring schedule. They have records for as long as they've been monitoring these residences. And none of these locations are technically downgrading or in a flow path from the landfill. So that's good news. <laughs> There's one location that a house was, in, uh, was constructed and they installed a well about 2,000. And that's over on the kind of right side of the peninsula. And they had their well sampled when they um, it's installed it and we sampled it again recently and it also had nothing in it. So the, the news for the residential wells is all good news. There's no VFCs, there's none of the emergent uh, constituents that we've been monitoring for. We sampled them for their routine monitoring parameters as well as the landfill parameters, <laughs> and we got a bunch of non-detects, which is excellent news. That means even looking as tiny as the lab can look, they didn't see anything. So that is really great news. And um, the, the environmental health is continuing to perform this monitoring annually <coughs> for these residences, so that's also great news. Was that correct in understanding that Alamance County has actually been testing the wells more than was required by the state? It's not required to test them at all. So everything that you've been doing is above and beyond what's required. It's just a service that you've been providing to those citizens there. The, a few of them are kind of precariously positioned between the sludge field and the landfill, so it's it's great, but you guys are doing it. It's awesome. Keep up the good work. <laughs> so when we looked at the historical data back in June of 2018, we identified three wells that had consist consistent uh, VOC detections. It was in 2, 4, and 7 <coughs> and And they had concentrations of both VOCs and metals. And a lot of times the metals will notice they're in the dirt, but sometimes if the groundwater chemistry changes a little bit, they start to show up, even though we're, we're not so worried about barium. Um, Buxton Environmental has been doing your groundwater monitoring for a number of years. The most recent results we have from them were collected in October of 2019. They're consistent with stuff that we've been seeing throughout the probably past 10 years. Um, We've been having these discussions with solid waste, and we've been developing a plan for what we're going to do for these three areas. And just to address kind of why that if we've been seeing the same things over the past 10 years, why are all of a sudden we're addressing them, some stuff has changed in the like, scope of Department, Department of Environmental Quality as well as of uh, the state of North Carolina, and the focus has been put on environmental issues with things like the Duke coal ash and with Comores. Uh, the media is making environmental stuff a hot topic now. So in response to all of that, DEQ is <coughs> kind of getting a little bit more strict on things than maybe they had in the past. There's also been some shifts in personnel positions over there, which is kind of changing of the guard. People do things a little bit differently. So we've noticed some changes that have come about with that. And Swepsonville falls into the category of closed landfills that were, were told that your post-closure monitoring period would be 30 years. And they're coming up on 30 years. <coughs> Next, in the, probably four years. And especially as they get closer to this end of post-closure monitoring, solid waste section has basically said we don't want landfills to not be monitored. So they're coming, instead of just extending it again, which is what they did the first time, they're making it so that you'll have to perpetually monitor your landfills, which is not surprising. So for your reference in the ice cream cone, sort of, that is Swepsonville. Uh, towards the top, at near section five is where seven A and B are. They're about 100 feet from the extent of waste. They are the furthest wells from waste, probably because that was the last area that was filled. Um, number four, we actually found waste all the way around well four, so we're going to take that well out because you don't need a well in your landfill. And um, towards the left-hand side, monitoring well two, 
That one, we're not exactly sure, but it's probably within 50 feet of the edge of the waste there. So just based on constraints and size, you're probably seeing some stuff in these wells just because they're butted up against the landfill. So another thing that we discovered in the process of this letter was a 48 inch reinforced concrete pipe. And we didn't know this was here until we started looking into the historical data and we found some old maps that had this line going through the middle of it. And it looks like they put this in prior to filling the landfill to protect this creek that was going through the original phase one and two. Um, part of this has initiated us to do extensive surface water monitoring and look at what's going on because this pipe goes through the middle of the landfill and it's been there since the 70s. Um, we've also started conversations with the Division of <coughs> Water Resources and the Army Corps of Engineers to handle anything that we might need to do or adjust or if we have to fix the pipe or if we need to move things around just to kind of get an idea of their blessing. What can we do? What, what does this mean in terms of permitting through them? And um, we'll be conducting some flow and biological monitoring of the downstream portions of that pipe to just determine has this had any effect? What's going on here? If we change things at this point, is there life in this stream that we're going to be affecting? How big a pipe is that? It's, it's a 48 inch pipe that goes about 1,600 feet. And it takes, it takes water. So there was a, there was a creek on. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I that map right there. So it comes up sort of from the left side of section five. There's a spring box up there. Yeah. And it, it, that creek water comes down and it, it diverts it through one and two. And then it comes out kind of near where monitoring well two is, and then that joins the tribute that tributary to Hog Creek that kind of intersects at the tip of the peninsula down there. So one more, and this is the most chemistry we're going to do. One um, four dioxane is an emerging chemical that's kind of a stabilizer for solvents that was used in a lot of manufacturing. This is uh, something that the labs have been able to, to analyze for for a while. It's been part of the list, but they could never see down very low. We could see till about 50 parts per billion, but now they've got better technology so they can see into the very low levels, and now they're doing that. And so in 2018, Solid Waste Section issued a memo asking everyone to analyze down to this new low level, um, which was an additional cost, but you guys went ahead and you have been doing that as long as they've been requesting and as part of your routine monitoring. And you have seen some detections of this new parameter in locations at Swepsonville, which is some of the reason that we've had to do some more extensive work because we didn't have any historical data on this because we only started sampling it as early as October of 2018. So this is just one of those new emerging chemicals as the labs get better, we see more, so they ask for more. Is it true that the one for a dioxane is in like a lot of stuff, like the we call it laundry detergent? Yeah. People commonly buy. So if you go to the group, if you go to Walmart and you go to the laundry detergent <laughs> aisle, every single laundry detergent that you buy there will have that. And it flushes <coughs> out through our systems, our water systems. It doesn't get cleaned up in the septic tank, and or it doesn't. You know, if you live in where there's um, the water and sewer is provided by a municipality, it goes through. I think there's there's levels of and I and I'm not sure I know some water plants have I guess revamped their systems to handle some of these emerging chemicals. So depending on where you live, maybe yours has. 
but not all of them have. If you're using something that was designed, I don't know, 40 years ago, it probably is not handling this as optimally as I can. So every septic tank in Alamance County that probably has that if you wash your clothes, is that what you're saying? Probably yes. in your septic yes. tank, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if it's not going through a, ma a main treatment facility, it's gonna be there. And this is kind of like normal consumer, what we would, might think of as normal consumer behavior and the science is catching up to identify maybe long-term results from what we've been doing for 50 years. Yes. Well, so even in the clothing we're wearing, we understand, right? Like any waterproofing or... That's a different chemical. So that is the stuff that when you hear about the stuff going on in Wilmington and Fayetteville, that's, that's that chemical. This dioxane is more like a... Like in the furniture manufacturing where they would stain and varnish and they would stabilize the solvents that they would clean things with, that's where this one comes from. And obviously <coughs> this is a pretty industrial area at point, so there's going to be a little bit of it out here. So where are we going from here? In January, which is this month, we're going to be putting in those additional wells at the landfill. Sometime in the first quarter of this year, we're going to take a camera and we're going to look at that 48-inch pipe to see if we can fix it or use it for anything. Um, we're going to start the flow and biology monitoring on Hawk Creek, and we're going to continue monitoring groundwater and surface water as we have been to this point. So for your drilling this month you're looking at about $45,000 to put in those additional deep wells and that's higher than a normal drilling cost because of all the extra things that go in with one drilling and rock two drilling these special types of wells that are not going to hopefully influence the rock aquifer by drilling through the, <coughs> the, the, the uppermost aquifer. Also related to the drilling, we'll have to do some additional analysis on those wells to confirm the whole point of putting them in is to get to the water. And then there'll be an additional cost for the flow and the biology monitoring over the course of the year. What's the depth of those deep wells? We're, we're proposing hopefully not more than 100 feet. But once I'll you get in, right, right. You do, you do not want to be paying. <laughs> so this is this is for a couple hundred feet of wells. All we all we have to do is get into the the bedrock, so beyond that weathered rock layer, and then we just find a fracture. So we're hoping within we're figuring based on these locations, we should be in competent rock by 40 feet, within 60 feet, we should have some sort of water. If not, we're gonna keep going. So, that's best case scenario. <laughs> then looking beyond this year, um, obviously with additional wells, there's an additional monitoring cost for that. If, in the terms of whatever agreement we work out with the solid waste section, they request uh, additional parameters, which would be the appendix two list or MNA parameter monitoring. If you do both of those lists, you're almost at $2,000 per sample. So it can get very expensive very quickly. Um, and then on top of your routine monitoring for solid waste section, there might also be additional monitoring locations that Army Corps of Engineers or Water Resources would request possibly additional flow or biology monitoring long term depending on what we do with the pipe. Um, in terms of mitigation and permitting for the 48 inch pipe, we're very early in the stages of knowing, basically we still have all the options open yet. We haven't eliminated it very much. So there's some less expensive options and there's some very expensive <coughs> options that we're trying to figure out hopefully by the mid to end of this year we'll have a good trajectory and we'll know we'll have a better grasp on where that's going especially cost wise let me ask just a couple of questions about the pipe so there's this old pipe that goes mm -hmm. underneath the landfill and um we're not really sure about what the condition of the pipe is 
and <laughs> you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Steve Gandy with Municipal Engineering. Maddie and I have been working on this, this project together. Uh, so you're the pipe guy. Yeah. He's the pipe guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a 48-inch RCP or reinforced concrete pipe. It's installed in sections like you might do a culvert underneath your driveway, sometimes 10-foot, 16, 20-foot mm -hmm. sections. When that was put together in the 70s, I'm assuming it was probably had a little rubber gasket in there. But like we all know, as the decades roll by, uh, that gasket is worn out. And we know the integrity of the pipe is gone because we've measured what's coming into the pipe and we've measured what's coming out. And we know the concentration of come with constituents are increasing through the length of the pipe. So our next job would be to determine, can we salvage the pipe? Is there a way to repair it to prevent this leaching into the pipe and then coming out in the creek? Um, and that's what the, the following work would entail. That was going to be my question. So you've tested the, the, the inflow side of the pipe and the outflow side of the pipe, and there is reason to believe that something's going on inside the pipe where the, the old landfill may be causing Correct. the water Some of the constituents, like the docks, and she mentioned, um, is, is at a lower level at the entrance than it is at the exit of the pipe. So we know it's getting into the pipe somehow. I mean, you can look back 40, 50 years ago, and you know, there's a creek running through there. We, we can put it in a pipe and pile 30 feet of trash on top of it. What could go wrong? Um, but, but that was the, the idea at the time. Um, and yes, there, there may be a chance to repair this pipe without you know, excavation and those types of things. And our next work is more exploratory to determine if the pipe can be salvaged. I mean, if it's completely collapsed, there's very little you can do. Then we would be looking at rerouting the stream and the creek. And uh, we've gone as far as to survey some areas and determine what it would take to reroute that stream. But when you begin to reroute navigable waters, or streams, the Army Corps of Engineers becomes involved. Uh, other sections of uh, the Division of Environmental Quality become involved. And it, it becomes very complicated as far as permitting that work. Goes. So we're looking at the, the most realistic and best way to, to solve that problem without creating more problems. Are there no PVC options to sleeve in that pipe? There are. I mean, um, how much water flow goes to underneath? It depends on how much rain we've had. Uh, and full rainfall, sometimes that pipe is halfway or three quarters full, and at times where you've had a drought, it's barely trickling out. Uh, there are dozens of technologies to replace that. There's things called slip <coughs> where you basically take an right. empty balloon, slip it through the pipe, inflate it, and it conforms to the inside of the pipe. Um, that would be possible if the pipe's integrity is still there and it hasn't collapsed. If the pipe's collapsed, that's really a the water's coming out the other end. That's correct. So if it's got block, how's that water getting? Well, it could be seeping through. You could just have a <coughs> mass of crumbled concrete and things, and the water just seeping through waste that's collapsed into the pipe. There could be roots in it. We really don't know until we can really. Uh, and then there's things like pipe bursting, where you take a steel pipe of a slightly larger diameter and insert it through the other pipe, and it bursts. You know, so at this time, we really like to know if it sounds like a lot of money to me. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound expensive. It sounds interesting. That sounds like a fun job. <laughs> you don't get paid to do it. Let's crawl on through there. Four eight in. That was the idea. Just a headlight. We just couldn't find a subject to crawl through the flashlight. Fifteen hundred foot balloon has got to be a big balloon, right? Yeah. It's a big pipe. That technology is usually limited to four hundred feet at a time to repair a sewer. You usually don't see a sewer line without a manhole more than four right. feet apart. Yeah, so the state it does that all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be have to be adapted to, to whatever we find on the inside of the pipe. Read some sort of lower lamp or something like that. Yes, That's not old technology. It's uh, pretty common. Yes, sir. Okay. Did you have anything else? Um, that's that's just about it. Thank you. Just um, yeah, if you have any additional additional questions or yeah. well, now, we're happy to take your questions yeah. while we're here <laughs> well i know the city of burlington has their own cameras and stuff is that not something we can look into using to just yeah, those that? are usually limited to about 400 feet and in this case we need to be able to go about 800 feet from each end to be okay. able to reach it and most of that equipment like i say is designed for sewer and uh, not of the um, length that we would need to, to determine the there's a limitation on that okay Put a manhole in at 400. <laughs> we could, uh, but installing something like that down through 30 feet of waste is uh, 
as a monumental part of disturbance. <laughs> the more we disturb it, the more likely we are to create an issue. We don't so, so there is waste over this pipe. Yeah, it, the, the pipe is under the lamp. Thirty feet. I want to ask a question. Uh, are you still involved with the, uh, what's that called, AEG? Yes. Yeah. Uh, do you still do the newsletter? We do, yeah. Okay, because the one online was 2016. I was just curious. For the association uh, or Carolinas? Yeah. Carolinas. I don't know about that. I'll ask. Yeah. Okay. I like to. Because it should have not been now. I apologize. <laughs> are, you one of you, you, are your backgrounds at state or do <coughs> either one of you? Yes, sir. I'm he, he gets that order. <laughs> okay. Can I tell you a story? Absolutely. I'm a big geologist, but I went to Campbell College. I mean, it's still Campbell College, Campbell University, it was Campbell College. But uh, we had a, a two professor geology department. And uh, I love geology, I could pass that. And, <laughs> but, for two summers, uh, we were told, uh, I was there for summer school, Vietnam was big, and so, you know, what was going on during that time, and they would tell us across campus, President Nixon's brother would be on campus uh, attending uh, our geology department. Are you familiar with what the, his relationship was no, with the state? No, Well, he would be on campus and, and go to our classes, sit in on our classes, go on field trips with the uh, class and so forth. His name was Edward Nixon. He was President Nixon's youngest brother. And he got his uh, bachelor's from Duke and got his master's from State. And he was just, uh, he was big into geology. And the sad part about it is, and I don't know what's going on with it, I called Campbell and I asked her for the geology department. And the girl answered the phone. She said, what? And I said, geology department. She said, well, I'm not sure. That may be under geography or something. I almost went through the floor. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she said, we teach it down at Fort Bragg at our Fort Bragg campus. And I knew that Campbell had a small campus. Well, what is the status of majoring in geology at the various colleges? I believe that our geologist. I'm an engineer. Oh, you're an engineer. Okay. She's this is, that's why we have her. <laughs> All right. So I, I think... This is a good thing. Earth science education is growing. Uh, a lot more young people and a, a lot more women are are getting into the earth science fields, not exclusively in geology, but for example, I graduated from Appalachian. When I graduated, there were nine majors. They have 135 now. So it's, it's growing. People are learning more and becoming more conscious of the earth that they live on. There's a lot more stuff about um, sustainability and our impact on the globe and just general mapping and research so I think overall people people are getting into the sciences and it's cool so why wouldn't they but I had to ask a good question so you're saying uh, Commissioner Sutton then may have asked for the wrong department you should have asked for earth science <laughs> I, have asked for earth science. Yeah. <laughs> I still say it should be in geology <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner, if I could just add, we'll, we'll continue to work with the state of North Carolina on uh, plans for the Swepsonville landfill site, and uh, we appreciate uh, Municipal's help and all the staff at the landfill. Uh, we'll keep working with the state, and we'll keep you posted as that plan develops. And when it comes to paying for uh, this, uh, uh, these new costs, we'll be looking at the landfill's uh, closure budget to do that. So. Sounds very good. Thank you so much. Okay, next item on the agenda is uh, grant application approval for emergency management. Good morning. Good morning. Happy New Year. I'm here today to seek uh, board approval for two grants. They're both Homeland Security. One is a Merck trailer, and what that is is a multiple emergency response trailer for $15,000. That trailer uh, will come with cones, barricades, signage, and we could use this when we're out trying to block off a road. You know, DOT has cones, but sometimes you know, we wait an hour, two hours for them to get there because they're tied up somewhere else. So this grant is uh, no county match. It's 100% through uh, Homeland Security. The next trailer is a cast trailer, and that's a, a companion animal support trailer. It's an enclosed trailer that's climate controlled will hold up to 43 animals. Um, we can use this trailer 
Well, we have to open shelters. Um, a lot of the shelters, you know, we've only got one in the county that won't let animals come in. Uh, we normally have to take them to the shelter and house them. A lot of people won't come to the shelter because they don't want to leave their animals. Um, so that was for $45,000. That one also is 100%, no county match, uh, and is a much needed, as I think, in this county. And uh, the animal shelters can also use it to take out for adoptions. I'm sorry, can you use it for what? Like adoption fairs. Oh, okay. so take them out. To yeah, the take their, their animals from the shelter out and have adoption cool. fairs at like sure. some of the yeah, malls. Yeah. <coughs> um, Do we need to vote on these separately? Or? That was my question. I know that we need uh, two <coughs> votes, one to approve the application and then two to amend the budget if it's awarded, but since it's two different grants, do we need two? I think to be safe, if you did two motions for each, that would be, that would absolutely cover what we need. One motion to approve on the first one. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the first grant application, which was for the trailer with the cones. Mm -hmm. um, if there's no further discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And then we would be seeking a motion to amend the budget if that grant is awarded. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve that budget amendment. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? And then the second grant was the one for the animal trailer. Yes, ma'am. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve application for that grant. If there's no further discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? And then the last motion for this uh, agenda item would be to amend the budget if that grant is awarded. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve that budget amendment. If there's no further discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. Thank, Thank you so much, Debbie. Okay. Jail renovation project. Um, is that? That's Mr. Andrews. Well, good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Um, before you this morning to request approval of a contract with Mosley Architects for divine, uh, design services uh, to, in order to renovate. Uh, the jail exercise area into new dorms for inmates. So this contract will allow us to uh, get Mosley started on doing design work to take this exercise area into a uh, space that would provide 16 to 24 new beds for inmates. So we did post this uh, request for proposal on our county website under our purchasing department. Mosley was in fact the only group that responded to our uh, request for proposal and the contract price that they have quoted to do this design work for us is $126,400. Our plan would be to pay for uh, Mosley's work from the proceeds of our $5 million loan. We've talked multiple times about we have capacity in the county's uh, capital budget, the long-term capital budget to borrow $5 million to do repair work across several county uh, buildings. One of them is the jail. We budgeted in that $5 million, $800,000 to pay for this renovation work. That does include this contract price for uh, mostly. So out of that $800,000 that we have just estimated, we don't know the exact cost of what it will uh, take to take this area into a dorm. We think it'll be around $800,000. Uh, we'd be spending $126,400 of that estimate to pay for Mosley to give us design uh, work that could then be bid. Until we have actual design done, we won't know the true price of the, of the work to be done. So, But um, due to the dollar amount of this contract, it requires board approval. So I'm, I'm authorized to sign a contract up to $50,000. Any contract over $50,000, I must bring before the board. So uh, what you would be approving today is our ability to enter into contract with Mosley to do the design work uh, for the new um, beds in the former exercise area. And I will say uh, one of the points to note here, uh, I've heard we've talked a lot about the, um, the facility down near DOT, the jail annex. You know, in our, in our county facility plan, long term, in the long term plan, the best practice would be to get all the detention operations on the property across the street. I mean, right now we're taking advantage of the jail space, uh, the state site, <coughs> which is great. I think that's requiring the, the sheriff's department to do uh, laundry and cafeteria food. 
those kind of things are having to be shoveled in the long term. There is capacity across the street. We're not talking about adding on to the footprint of the jail is my understanding. This is existing space that's contiguous to the jail now that would be changed from what it is into these dorms. So, uh, the request for today is to approve this contract. Then you would get, once the design work is done, the bids would be put out for the work to be done, then you'd get the price for the work, the actual work. But we have to get design work done before we'll know that. At this point, I'll be happy to answer any questions. I'm sure the sheriff would be too about uh, uh, what this would mean for the detention. Does, does anybody know why we didn't get but one bid? I, the only thing I can think of is, I know in the past, jail work can be contentious. Yeah, and we had a problem before, but we built that thing. Yeah. I remember we couldn't get bids. So we, that, that's the only yeah. guess I could make. Uh, Is that yeah. what you think? Sure. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how many, uh, I can't speak very much to the requirements to do jail work. I know that jail work is monitored by the state and, and other agencies oversee that. So it may be that, I'm just guessing here, that design firms may not have been issued to tackle yeah. this. It can be a, be a headache for, for I, I bet the can. architects and building the jails. You, all well know what we went through when we built a new case. Yeah, we finally had to run the old one contractors out. Yes, sir. And I don't think we've dealt with Mosley uh, in, in a number of years. I asked Buddy, uh, we, we've not done any contract work with Mosley uh, that we're aware of. And I think, uh, is that right, Buddy? The only thing I know of, they were involved in the renovation at the jail several years ago. And that's all that I can find on. And I don't think we have them as an approved, I mean, a vendor that's been receiving payments for quite some time. So this would be relatively a uh, relatively new firm to us. Did we put a million dollars into the state uh, prison yard? We've got a million. We refurbished that. Uh, I, I don't remember uh, you know, how much it was when yeah, initially. It was. Yeah, the deal there, we don't own it. That's right. And uh, so let me ask a question now. Is that. <clears throat> That's the on the corner. It's got the open air to top, right? Yes, sir. Okay, that's correct. Is it going to be double decked or is it just going to be a single? That that will be mostly, but I, I think it's going to be single. It's going to be dormitory setting, which means that uh, take less staff looking looking after settings. And what a lot of people don't know, uh, Mr. Sutton, is there's so many doggone rules governing the operations of a jail. For instance, classification inmates. We can't put felons with misdemeanors. Uh, we can't put uh, marshals with ICE. We can't put uh, ICE and federals with the uh, uh, state. Plus the fact that we have a lot of co-defendants who are going to testify against one another. We have to keep them separated. We've got gang members coming in from one gang and another. And we've got to have a place to be able to separate these people to, to keep them safe. Uh, also, the state mandates the sheriffs now to hold the state misdemeanors because they closed all the misdemeanors camps. Uh, what I would like to see at some point in time uh, in this is use those state misdemeanors. We do use some of them, but we can only hold like 15 right now. They clean our, our hallways and stuff in the sheriff's office. I would love to see us be able to take these uh, individuals and pick up the trash is along our highways if y'all have had a chance to get around. And uh, they are demanding us hold more inmates now than what we used to. And so we're gonna need space one place or the other uh, and to be able to keep inmates secure, we need to do some of this stuff. And is that second or third floor, is it? That's on the second floor. Second floor, is our third floor? I hate it. So what Anders? How many floors is it? There, there's really three floors. That's what I thought. <laughs> and uh, and I'll, I'll tell you this, initially I think uh, that was built uh, for the inmates to work out and uh, and, and that's not going to happen. Uh, you know, I'm not going to allow inmates to go in and lift weights so they can whoop the detention officers. Now I'll just tell you that right well, now. Well, no, you know, you know, I go back on this all the way, but we put that up there because of INS. And, and I got a question about that. We put that up there because INS said that if we were going to go into a contract with them, that we had to have outdoor, so-called outdoor recreation. And the open air qualified it. <coughs> okay. And I think the cost was about, I don't know, it, it was a million dollars or whatever. It was. And that was the only way I was going to vote for the new jail was to get that there. Right. Because I wanted the INS contract. 
And we had to put in that up in the corner, qualify. Mm -hmm. So did. Now, if we do away with it, uh, does that knock us out of any consideration for anything with the feds? No, sir. When I became sheriff in that jail up and I met with uh, uh, INS at that point in time, and I explained to them that we would not be using that facility uh, for the inmates. And uh, they said, well, uh, you know, you can't have the contract. I said, fine. Well, then about two days later, I called back and said, hey, that has been waived because when we talk about open air, we talk about a yard that they can get out in. And I said, well, there's no way that we can do that. And we got the contract, and we still have the contract. So, again, knocking that out and putting it in this dormitory will not disqualify us for any future involvement with ICE? No, sir, not unless they change the rule. All right, good. That's all I want to know. I support it. And the, uh, you know, we've talked numerous times about the $5 million loan that we're planning to take out and do work. Uh, this $800,000 renovation of the jail is only part of what we would be doing at the jail. We're going to replace some air handlers to the tune of almost half a million dollars and do some foundation work at the jail, too. And then that $5 million will also be spent partly at HSC over at the uh, Human Service Center, EMS Garage, J.B. Allen Courthouse, the Historic Courthouse, uh, Family Justice Center. So there's several key buildings in, count in our inventory that would receive work from this $5 million. This is, this is a part of it. But again, what we're asking for today is to approve the contract for design so we can get biddable documents um, from Mosley to put out the bid to see is this uh, $800,000 budget reasonable? Is that going to do it? If it doesn't, are we going back looking at the $5 million and reallocating? So. Question about Mosley again, too. Do they not have some of the, are they not doing some of the work for ABSS or for They're doing ACC? ACC? I, think, uh, I think that's possible, yes. They're, they're designing these schools. Would you back out? I was using a calculation of 126 and 800 at about, which would be about 15%, mm -hmm. which is right on the top edge of architectural cost. Indeed. But if you back out the 126 from the 800,000, it goes up to about 18%. They're doing a lot of work for the county and various pieces of the county. They're hitting us pretty high. I think it's extremely high myself. That's oh, just my great. opinion. Their only response, if, if the board doesn't want to go with this but wants to go with the contract, we can post it again and see what we get. That's fine too. But uh, I do think we're we're reaching a point where we're getting, we were hoping to be able to take uh, the $5 million loan to the LGC uh, this spring. So we would want to do that very quickly if we repost. Uh, but we can we can certainly do that too. It'd be my suggestion that we hold off and try I'll second, I'll I'll second it if that's a motion. Yeah. Yes. You, like you wouldn't need to motion if you direct me to, to, if the board directs me to do that, that's what we will do, but I'd be looking Let's for some there. consensus. Well, I have a couple of questions okay. before we move on. I just wanted to go back to um, the things that Mr. Vines was saying that um, figuring out per square foot the estimated cost. So I think Mr. Vines was thinking that the whole $800,000 divided by um, 1,500 square feet would yield price per square foot. So what you're saying is that we should, if we're going to look at it that way, we need to subtract the architect's fee from the $800,000. And then, so that would bring it down to $449 per square foot, which still appears maybe on the, you know, high edge of it, but that was an estimate to kind of get the ball rolling. That's right. We, we don't have a firm figure for what this will cost. And again, you'd have the ability to see that figure once it's arrived at, but for us to get it, we, we have to have a, a design. Now, once you get the design done, even if you, even if let's say you pay Mosley or some other architect to do the design work and it comes back in and it's going to cost $2 million to do it above and beyond the, the money we just paid Mosley, the board can say, no, we're not going to do that. And we bump it, but we would have a design from then on that maybe at some future date, if it wanted to be uh, the project wanted to be implemented, we could do it. But the problem right now is we're 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 estimating what this cost would be. It could be higher, could be lower. We just don't know. That's about the best estimate we could come up with. Yeah, Another issue time. too, though, is the fact that we're looking at demolition in addition to construction, right? I, I I'm not sure how much the uh, demo there might have to be some inside of the. You know, right now it's a. 
I have seen this space. It's like a walled space. Right. Uh, pretty open. There's, there's, open there, room. there's nothing in it. Uh, I think that's it was, why it even sounds higher. Yes. So <laughs> there may have to be something that's taken out. I think there may be you know some electrical work, mm -hmm. electrical fixtures and things like that would have to be removed. I don't know, but uh, that put bathrooms in, showers in, uh, electrical. Work. This is going to be about the same size, sheriff, as the space I toured about two weeks ago. Where you're holding ice detainees now? Yes, sir. Dormitory with a yes, showers, open showers at one end with a like a half rail. Yes, sir. and uh, dining space and bed space and everything all self-contained. I think so. It would be. I also figured it if the project costs um, six hundred and seven. I think I did it six hundred and seventy-three thousand six hundred. So subtracting out the architect's fee and then divided that by. 24 beds it looks like it comes out to about $28,000 per bed and I would be interested to know how that compares with um, costs of jails in general you know, yeah. sure. that would be uh, an interesting um, point to know are we high or low on <coughs> the average for that well, going for you should figure what we pay 12 million for the jail yes sir and have what was capacity 400 or something uh, it was uh, so we hold in 70s uh, Excuse me, it's holding 80 mm -hmm. prison in it, and we got a total capacity of 476. So you're looking at uh, 392 beds, something like that. Uh, say that into 12 million figures. Put your calculator on that, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> Again, th th this uh, this $800,000 is an estimate. She just said what? 30,000? 30,303. Okay, and that was for how long has the jail been over there? It opened uh, up in. Are you talking about the old jail too? Well, the new April first, two thousand seven. Yeah, okay. the new jail. All right, so we paid we paid too much, but we paid twelve million for the new jail, right? And the new jail is going to have how many beds? Definitely four hundred, three hundred something. Well, with the old, the old jail and and the, new, and the new jail is like three hundred ninety two. Okay, beds. Well, what was the new jail capacity? Uh, definitely, I'll be. Well, this was. It's like an argument, well, maybe 60%. I, I, I don't know, but uh, I don't know. those are old quotes, too, mm -hmm. as far as it uh, figured that you just about it out. So then uh, $28,000 per bed for 24 beds sounds like it, that maybe tends to make one think it's more reasonable. We just we won't know that for sure until we get, uh, you know, once we have a design, if that's bid, which we always reserve the right to reject bids. So if, if we do the design work, whether that's now with Mosley under this current this current proposal, or it's with some other group uh, that uh, might respond to this now, uh, either way, once it's done and we bid it out, and I'm coming back before you saying, okay, we have a bid to do this work and it's going to cost blank. Then then we'll know this is this is a target. This is on target for jail bed space around the state or the southeast. I, I can't tell you any of that information right now. Uh, it's, kind of, it's all kind of an estimate. It's, the only thing I know for sure is we hire Mosley. It's $126,400. Okay. So we have a motion. Don't let Brennan get involved. <laughs> we have an, a motion and a second not to approve the contract at this time and to resolicit bids for this project. Um, I'm going to call for a vote on it since we had a motion and a second. But there's, is there any more discussion? If there's not, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Next, we have uh, something from the health department, and here comes Stacy Saunders. <laughs> it's a bit of an obstacle. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so today we have um, representatives from the health department giving you a presentation um, about a GIS project. Um, and this was a presentation that was given to the Board of Health and members of the Board of Health, including um, Commissioner Carter, um, urged us to also present it to you all as it is um, one, highlighting um, quality improvement for our citizens to be able to access and assess information um, that is uh, about the properties. And two, it's a highlight of the collaborative effort between uh, multiple county departments. So showing you that you know, these departments actually work together a lot. Um, and so with that, I'd like to introduce Becky Rosso, who is behind me, um, from Environmental Health at the Health Department. Um, and Becky is our on-site well and wastewater supervisor, and it's going to give you the presentation. 
Good morning, commissioners. Thanks for having me. As Stacy said, I'm Becky Rossum, and I'm a supervisor with the health department. I'm going to talk with you today about um, environmental health and the on-site wastewater section, how we've been evolving over the years, and more specifically about some um, uh, computer program we've been using that MIS developed, as well as some technology and how that technology has allowed us to collaborate and share data with several departments. And as Stacy mentioned, how that's benefiting not only us but other departments as well as, most importantly, our citizens. So environmental health, uh, we opened our doors in 1938, the health department. Uh, we had one health director, one meat inspector, two public health nurses, a clerk, and a sanitarian. The main function of a sanitarian was to inspect privies for proper construction and maintenance, as you can see from that image right there. With the suit and tie and all, right? Um, so uh, very professional. And so uh, these were out in the county limits where no one had uh, indoor plumbing. So that was the first type of sewage disposal system. As homes begin to have indoor plumbing, we see our sewage disposal systems change. Um, uh, we are seeing on-site sewage disposal systems for homes that are outside of city limits, so they have no access to municipal <coughs> sewer water. And so we'll talk a little bit about how the systems have changed and how we've evolved. So take a look at the sewage disposal record. Um, the name on there could be the uh, property owner, it could be the building uh, contractor, it could be the septic contractor. As you can see on the location, there's no actual address. So if you're not from this area or if we're trying to find this property 10 years from now, it's very hard for us to figure out where we're going, right? So these original cards back from the 1960s uh, had very little organization to the name and location of the property in relation to the septic system. Um, you can also see that it references that, or that there is a water supply of a well, but we do not know where the well is located. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the septic systems are changing, so we now have a septic tank, that's that small box, and we have the 160 by 30, that's the drain field line. Um, so our systems are now underground, they're on-site sewage disposal and no longer privies. <coughs> Slide. It's interesting. You'd have to ask directions at the store to get there, right? And I'm not from this area. And um, <laughs> if the store is closed, how, how am I going to ask directions? <laughs> so yes, that's exactly right. Um, this is a permit from the 1990s, and so as you can see, there's a little bit more information on them. We actually have a name of the property owner. We have a location. We have an address. We have a telephone number to call them, um, and we have some more information on the permit. We have the proposed home. We have the well, we have the septic tank, and the drain line, and the line lengths. And so why is this important? Like, why do we need to know this information? Why do we, Environment Health, really need this information? And so it's that we can uh, re-replicate uh, this permit out in the field. So before anybody can build on a home, build on a property, or do any improvements to their property, they need to come through our department. They can't get a building permit until they come to our department and get an environmental permit. And so either we go out to the property and evaluate the soil to see if it's suitable for a septic system, or we would go out with a probe. As you can see, the gentleman in the smaller image, he is using a probe rod. That's one of the tools we use to try and locate the septic system. And so that's if they're going to build a pool or an addition or something like that. We want to ensure that we know where the septic system is so that they are not um, putting the addition over top of the septic system. Our job is to protect the groundwater and the water supply. So by ensuring we're not causing a septic system to prematurely fail, we're protecting that water supply. All right, so in 2008, we begin using that uh, MIS computer program I mentioned. So uh, they developed it in-house. It's been an excellent program. It is designed to allow our departments to communicate more effectively. So what we were hearing from our citizens and you know customers was that they would come to our office, well they go to building inspections to get a building permit, realize they need to come to our office, come to our office, go back to building inspections to get a permit, going back and forth, back and forth. So they were going cross town making multiple trips. So MIS developed this program so our department and building inspections could talk without really talking, right? They could they can see all of our documentation, we can see all of theirs. And so just to kind of talk through that image on the screen, that is our well permit screen. And so, um, just to show the back and forth, they come to our office for a well permit. Uh, then we go out and do the grout inspection. Then building inspections does the well trench inspection. So that's that image popped out. So that's the electrical and the plumbing. And then they come back to our office. Uh, we go do the wellhead inspection. 
and then they can get a C or C certificate of occupancy or certificate of completion. Sorry about that. And then they can get their certificate of occupancy. So you can see lots of back and forth. Um, so now instead of going across town, they can just pick up the phone or they can open up this program and see where we are in the process with this permit. So it's been a great help to our citizens as well as our um, our staff. Um, another point I'd like to make is that uh, we get over 2,000, almost 3,000 requests for information a year. It's a lot of requests. So now our staff, all of the files, those cards are scanned into this computer program. So they open up the computer program, they find the documents they need, they can email it from their desk, they can print it and hand it to the customer. So no longer do they have to get up, go search through the files and try to find the documentation. Um, so it's uh, really saving our staff a lot of time. And again, it's saving the uh, community a lot of time as well. And so uh, we also talked about how we're using some new technology. So this is a GPS unit. We began using those in 2011. Uh, the triple unit, we take that out into the field with us. We collect our data points. So we'll pick up all of our auger borings, a house location, those types of things. Come back to the office and we can uh, design this really great um, smaller image, that's our permits today. So more accurate, uh, more clear and concise for our citizens to understand the information on there. So out in the field, like I said, the red box is the house. They've picked up those four corners. They've pick, picked up the yellow area, that's the septic area. The red lines, that is the <coughs> septic lines, and they've got a tank on there as well. So they can pick up all that information, and it's within sub-meter accuracy. So the best part about this is our permits are good for five years. So someone could come in and apply for an improvements permit and four years later decide they want to install this septic. So you can imagine in four years time we can see lots of trees, lots of things could happen in this property. So for us to ensure the septic systems are being installed in the right location, we can take this unit, go back out to the property and like I said within sub-meter accuracy, recreate this permit. So we're ensuring that the septic systems are going to be installed in the right location. So all, very often we are um, meeting homeowners, contractors, septic contractors out on properties with this unit just to do that very thing to make sure septics are going in the right area. Um, and it, it is, this information is being shared across the county departments as well as with the public. All right, so as I mentioned, we're um, sharing data with several departments. The one department we're sharing with is GIS, and they're using our field-located property irons to improve the accuracy of their property lines on the publicly accessible GIS website. So the little red dots that outline the boundary of this image, that's the property boundaries. Uh, those are the irons we're picking up in the field. Um, so GIS can, from their desk, open up the GIS program. Uh, all they have to do is click on environmental health layer they can see our irons, and they can adjust the property lines in the GIS program. And so this is extremely important for the citizens. The, um, <coughs> the GIS website received 7,700 visits just last month, in the last 30 days. So uh, our citizens are using this website, so it's very important for it to be um, as accurate as it can be. And so by having our points, they are doing just that, making it more accurate, um, so people uh, can make more informed decisions about their property. And again, it's saving GIS staff by not having to go out into the field and collect this data. They've got ours. And so uh, we're also sharing this information with addressing. So addressing will um, use our house sites. Again, that's the red boxes and the driveway location to determine a house address. Um, so typically they would have to wait till a house begins construction or driveway is installed for they, them to determine what the address is going to be. But now again, they can just from their computer, turn on our layer, see where our images are, and give a, give a property an address. So they're saving time and the citizens are getting their address more quickly. And lastly, we've been sharing our data with the tax department. And so as you can see on the image, there's lots of pink dots. Those are our unsuitable soil board. So someone's gone out, dug a bunch of holes, and the, on, the, so, the soil is unsuitable. Um, you see the red dots up there. Uh, those are actually drip irrigation borings. So that those are suitable borings, but they're very shallow soil. It takes a lot of space to make a system for that. So this property uh, was denied for suitability of septic system. 
And so how this is helping the tax department is they can use this data to determine if they can give a portion of a property a tax adjustment. So they're helping uh, the citizens with a uh, little savings. And um, they still need a letter from us, that's, that's part of the process. But by turning on this layer right there from their desk, they can not only see that we've properly covered the property, but um, that it's unsuitable and then they can give a much better tax adjustment. And so this image has the Trimble unit, uh, the unit we've been taking out to the field, and a new unit we've been piloting. It's an arrow unit. And um, as you can see, it's a bigger screen. Uh, it's full color. It's, it's great for our staff. And they take this out into the field. And what's particularly great about this tool is that it is real-time cloud-based. So when we're on large tracts of land or we're in a subdivision, we a lot of times have multiple staff out there for efficiency. So uh, they could be completely on the opposite sides of the property. Nobody, they can't see each other, and they can be digging holes, and um, they can pull, they can pull up the map and see exactly in real time where the other person's been. Prior to this, the GPS unit, you'd collect the information, go back to the office, download it, and have to kind of see are there gaps in where we've been digging our holes. But now they can see it right there in the field, um, so they can um, move around and dig holes as they need. Um, and it, again, it's saving them from having to go back into the office. So we're getting to uh, issue permits more quickly. And we're just being more efficient with our time and uh, money. And so this last map is an image of all of the points we've collected. So in uh, under 10 years, we've collected over 100,000 pieces of data. Um, and so, like I said before, it's not only accessible to um, all the different departments we've talked about, but it's accessible to the citizens through that GIS website. Um, and so it's very important for us to continue to use this technology and give this information to our citizens. And I um, just wanted to make sure that I said thank you to all of the departments that have been involved in this. They give us feedback all the time, our MIS department. How many times I pick up the phone and call one of them and ask them to make a small change or to add something because the rules change. So they've been really great and several of them are in the audience today. Um, and so thank you all for your hard work on this. Um, and if you have any questions, any of us can really answer any of them. Thank you for your time today. I, I got a question. What is the lag time on getting out of a <coughs> permit for new homes? Between when when I submit an application to get my field rep out to check this So out. it varies. Um, we are currently um, a couple weeks behind. Um, that's not untypical across the state. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, subdivisions coming to the county, which is great. Um, a lot of, of uh, people want to build in our county, but <coughs> it does require us to go out and do a lot more permitting. So we're, we're sitting right now in a couple weeks, about three weeks. And just out of curiosity, this gentleman sitting over here, is that him that was checking that privy? Uh, it probably <laughs> was, because I think he's been around for about that long. We just can't quite get rid of him. I thought I, I, thought I recognized him, too. <laughs> yes. Did you take Terry's position? I did not. Okay. Um, Carl is the interim, Carl and I'm interim. just one okay. of the supervisors. Just trying to figure out mm -hmm. who's doing what under there. Yeah. Very good. Mm -hmm. you have any other questions? If you got a question, ask it. I should know this. Uh, do we have developments where they have a huge field somewhere off to the side for all the houses? For Becky, uh, are you familiar with what I'm talking about? Yeah. Becky, there's some collecting. So we do have some in the county. Um, we have what we what we more often have is um, off sites. So we may have a big, large area with off site <coughs> systems. But um, typically those are one home has one off-site lot. So we're not seeing a lot of multiple homes being uh, into one septic system. Most people have just their one system with their designated repair area. But there are some um, out there. See, I'm all over Guilford County every day. And they've got nice developments too, mm -hmm. up in Oak Ridge. I mean, these are nice mm -hmm. homes, and, and a lot of them. And you turn into their development, and there's this, I didn't know what it was. It's just a huge field. Mm -hmm. All the green field. Yep. It will be green in the summer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's got a yeah. white fence around it, mm -hmm. and it looks nice. And I didn't yeah. know what it was. And I asked the kids one time, I said, what's that over there? I go, that's the septic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, um, Gilbert County has had a septic uh, off-site ordinance for a long time. 
And so there's lots of guidance around how to maintain those systems to make sure that they're not having trees growing in them and all that. Um, but yeah, so it just depends on who does the subdivision and if they're wise enough to find the good soil and position the homes so that they can use the soil the most efficiently for them. Mm -hmm. It's not uncommon. Just all right, if there's yes, no further questions, thank you so much. All that right. was an interesting presentation. Can I jump in for a second? Of course. Um, I've been involved with a lot of these different things, and you know, you talk about return on investment. Um, this has been a long time coming, and it really helps the citizens. Um, Marlena's group, you know, you saw that GPS unit, the other things you discovered, this new thing, it's about a third of the cost. I mean, it's always saved, you know, it saves time on permitting, it saves, you know, mistakes being made in the field, gives people information. It's been a long-term process at the, the health department and the GIS and MIS, and it's, it's your investment in those things that have made it better for our citizens. And a lot of local counties don't have this service, so uh, it's, it's, very it's a really good thing. Yeah. I, sorry, I had to jump in. It's good. It's so those guys are, and it's all their work. They do fantastic work, even Carl. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Okay, next on our agenda, we have a budget amendment from Parks and Rec, Recreation and Parks. Good morning, Commissioner. Quick budget amendment today. Um, in August, you guys applied for, uh, approved a grant that we applied for from Impact Alamance. Uh, $25,000, it was for improving the playground and the exterior areas at Pleasant Grove Community Center. We were awarded that grant, uh, so this is a budget amendment that will allow us to accept and spend that money. Uh, to improve present Pleasant Grove community session. I think that's a great idea. I'll make the motion to approve it. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve that budget amendment. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. Thanks. Health Department budget amendment. <coughs> So before you, you have a performance management um, budget request and amendment um, in the amount of $132,500. Um, just to give you a little bit of a reminder and background, um, so this request of $132,500 um, has been a long time coming. So we've been um, at the health department saving this PM money because we had a vision. Um, I call it me being sort of the little red hen, right? So we had a vision. Uh, for our electronic medical record system um, to transition to EPIC, uh, which is what our um, hospital partner at ARMC um, and other hospitals in our area use. And so this is pretty exciting. Um, so this request is to purchase and fully transition to EPIC as our electronic medical record um, with our partners at ARMC um, and our other health system partners. Um, to be able to integrate our medical records completely um, and improve continuity of care. So before we had a, or, and right now, we have an electronic medical record that doesn't talk to our partners. And so when folks who see us at the health department for <coughs> services go to a hospital system, we still have to either call or fax and send paper things. So this actually will help us integrate our medical records completely. So that um, just like with GIS that you just heard about, we'll be able to talk to each other without actually having to talk with each other. And so this is a great improvement for continuity of care. Um, and so that's how we decided to spend our uh, performance management money. And what you have before you is also a breakdown. Um, and I would just like to say that the HIPAA compliant archival system is the highest bid, but we're waiting for one more bid from our actual um, current electronic medical record about just using theirs as a read only. So we're hoping that that cost will come down. And then the, the bulk of it, though, is the hardware that goes with it to make it compatible. And will our patients be able to access this similar to what you can do under my chart with Duke or with Yes. Uh, Not right at implementation, but that is the second wave right. of it. That's Absolutely. Well. Yes. Okay. Lots of um, bells and whistles that come with this one. Right. Yeah. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve that budget amendment. Is there any more discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, thank, thank you, you so much. much. The next item on our agenda is uh, public speakers on items which are not related to agenda items. However, we had nobody to sign up today for that, so we don't have that item to do. And then there's no commissioner responses. Um, 
Mr. Hager, did you have a county manager report? Uh, yes, I do. The only item I had to cover with the commissioners is we received notice from Coble Sandrock, uh, a private uh, landfill type facility here in Alamance County that they are intending to increase their uh, gate rate. Now, this is a requirement of our ordinance that they have to let uh, the commissioners know. That lets the public know there's no action needed by the board, but they're planning on going from $33.50 a ton to $36 a ton effective March 1 of this year. So we received a letter and I want to be sure to bring it to your attention. And I would appreciate the work those folks down there do. So that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner, comments? I like what it's all about the situation with the jail. If we look at the, uh, we look at the, I looked over the contract with uh, Mosley and it looked like they're doing all the engineering work as well. There's no outside engineer. Would that be a factor in the increased cost? Is that versus the typical, what I was able to determine? You know, I think uh, Mosley is one of those firms that has all, I believe has all that in house. So, and some of the firms that respond to our proposals on occasion won't have an engineer or won't have a certain expert, and they'll they'll always let us know we're bringing in Brian Haygood Engineering, and I'm not sure you know, what effect that might have on the cost. But uh, we're talk just after the item, I touch base with Susan. We'll be sure and repost this and uh, do as much advertising as we can. We posted before uh, uh, on our website, so we'll try to get the word out. And I think just having this discussion here today will also help get the word out about it, too. I mean, I don't really like to see us slow anything down, but I just feel like they're, they're really going way high on the price on this. Well, I think we're, we'll put it out for maybe 10 days. Uh, and my, my hope is if we can get a response back in 10 days and try to get it before the commissioners as quickly as possible, that'll keep us on target for the uh, uh, loan process that we're looking to do, but uh, uh, that's fine. I'm, I'm sure we can we can get it out. Yeah, most most of the firms do have an engineering right group with their group. I, uh, I think ACC that's the way it's been. And, uh, ABS has same thing. Any, I, I would imagine any firm that would bid on jail work probably would because it, it is going to be a little more complicated than than some of the other work we put out sometimes. Well, it's not residential and it's not typical commercial. Still, eighteen percent. Right. Well, technically, that's a small job for right. somebody that does that sort of stuff. To have to come in and do all the technicalities of what's required. Hopefully, we'll get somebody locally that will bid too. Would be nice. Sure. We do have engineering, architectural firms here. Yes. May I ask a question? Is your name Leslie? Yeah. Hi. Hey, how are you? Good. I thought it was you. Uh, may I ask a question, <laughs> Madam Chair? Sure. Of course I can. can uh, I understand. I understand that uh, you are working on a, a project to do a uh, to do a, a video about Alamance County. Yeah, that's correct. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what the situation is with that? Or yeah, totally. Um, well, I'm Leslie. This is my partner Michael. Uh, we're new to North Carolina, and we're interested in filming a county in the United States over the course of a year. And we found Alamance, so um, we're looking forward to getting to know the place and the people who live here and all sorts of things that are happening. Okay. It's Michael Green. Michael yes, Green. Sir. <laughs> yes, now, <laughs> she states on her website that you're from Durham, is that correct? We live in Durham right now. Both of you live in yeah. Durham? Yeah. Okay. Are you involved with the uh, film festival in Ann Harbor, Michigan? You're not? No, no. That's another Leslie Raymond? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I do produce documentaries for a living. I do a lot of sports documentaries, mostly out of California and Hawaii and Australia and all over. So this is a personal project that we're working on. And I understand you went to school in uh, Emerson at La in Los Angeles. Is that correct? Uh, Emerson in Boston. Emerson. Oh, College. Boston. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So um, I went to school in Boston. We're both from Texas. Lived out in LA, and now we're in North Carolina. Welcome to North Carolina. Thank well, you. <laughs> if, if I may say this, uh, we've had people come in here and do things on Alamance County, and it's not been very balanced. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope uh, this is uh, definitely innocent and, and uh, well intended and not political. Um, PBS came in here years ago out of New York and uh, did a, uh, did a uh, it was shown nationwide, and it was in regards to. Uh, our policies on immigration <clears throat> and uh, 
it could not have been more fair and balanced. Mm -hmm. And I think that's all anybody asks when somebody does anything on, on mm -hmm. us or anybody else is for it to be fair and balanced and, uh, and that there be no agenda involved. And so I hope that's what this case is. And I appreciate uh, you being able to talk to me here. Yeah. If, I could, if I could address that, um, yeah, our, our aim is to document life in Alamance County over 2020. And as we all are aware, I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting year um, <laughs> from all sides for, for yeah. many of the reasons. Of the year. <laughs> yeah. So um, we, we really love this county. We've kind of fallen in love with it. Graham was the first place we came to. It just kind of, you can tell there's a place where things are changing, but it's also got some history and, you know, deep roots. Deep roots. So it just speaks to us. Uh, we don't really know what we're going for, but we promise a <laughs> fair and balanced view. Yeah, and very, and we're very genuine in that intention. Okay. So, if well, anyone would like to speak to us further, um, I'm happy to talk to anyone afterwards or get in touch. And if you want to invite us to your home to film, or <laughs> <laughs> come see your farm, or come meet your kids, we're happy to do that too. We really want to get to know the place and the people here. Okay, before we adjourn, um, there are a couple of things in today's Burlington newspaper which caught my eye. One was a very nice article about Commissioner Lashley on the front page. That was nice to see some uh, well-deserved recognition for your years of service on the board. It's been a place. It's been a place. And as time draws to the end of 2020, I'm sure we'll be saying more nice yeah. things about those of you who have served for such a long time. The other item was at the bottom of the page about the Burlington City Council is going to discuss providing emergency communication services for Graham. And that was a big surprise to me as chair of the county commission. And I spoke to the county manager when we came in and it was a surprise to him as well. And I thought that it would be uh, warranted to take a few minutes to talk about what the county knows about Graham changing from using the county for their telecommunications and switching over to Graham. All we know about Graham's intentions and Burlington's intentions really comes from this newspaper article. Um, they, the article says they're going to, Burlington's going to hire four new tele, full-time telecommunicators at a cost of, annual cost of $254,000. Now Graham pays the <coughs> county for telecommunication services, right? And we use the kind of the percentage model that we adopted through the animal services contract, sort of the same sales tax kind of model. That's correct. Um, how much do they pay the county now? Uh, the current bill for the city of Graham for fiscal year 1920 for um, dispatch services was $130,478. So we're still awaiting that payment. So they haven't been, when was the payment so, um, requested for invoices? I think Susan would, uh, would, be able to, would be able to say that. You know, I, I would say that uh, I became aware of this as a rumor about a month and a half ago, in November of last year reached out to uh, the city manager from Graham to ask could this be confirmed because we hadn't heard anything in CECOM about it concrete and was told that it was a possibility but uh, that it was being debated and that we would be kept in the loop as it developed. So needless to say it was a surprise to see it on the front page of the Times News today. I've not talked to the city of Burlington about this at all, not from their police. Uh, but their communications department runs through their police department so I haven't heard from their uh, police folks or from their city management. Uh, so it was, it was a interesting article to read. So what are our steps forward? Well, I've, I have let the city of Graham know that there would certainly be some concerns from our part in that uh, if, if the city of Graham transfers, moves to Burlington for dispatch, that means their 911 calls will be transferred just like Burlington's uh, is today, which I personally see as a weakness in our system. Anytime a citizen calls 911 in Alamance County, whether they live in Graham or Burlington, they currently get our dispatch center. Uh, if it's a Burlington caller, once our folks determine they live in the city of Burlington and they need Burlington Fire Police, we actually transfer the call. And that is a point of weakness, right? We, we, dealt, we have dealt with issues in the past that have come from that transfer. 
So uh, I, did, I did tell the city of Graham that we hope that they would consider that as they, as they weigh the options of where they want to receive their dispatch service, that if they want dispatch done from uh, the city of Burlington, you know, there would be some concern to make sure that residents, uh, you know, everyone understands we would have to transfer those calls and, and possibly incur some of the same difficulties that we see. But I would certainly hope that uh, we get the opportunity, at least at the management level, maybe with leadership from their fire and police and their uh, uh, city administration to talk about this. Because, you know, our facility plan and our long range plan and uh, efforts here at Alamance County have been to look at consolidating right. these dispatch centers. Whether if they're not all under one roof, right, if they're not all Alamance County running the show, they're at least in the same building. Because, you know, if I'm transferring a call uh, to Burlington and we're sitting on the same floor, that, that's a whole lot better than we're doing it across town. Uh, uh, so anyway, it's a surprise. Uh, we had worked with the cities to come up with a model, as the chair said, based on uh, uh, the same model that we very recently adopted on how we bill, uh, how the bills are sent out for the animal services. Uh, so we've adopted that same model, and Graham shares a little over $130,000. So hopefully after today, uh, maybe uh, I will certainly be reaching out to both city managers and asking that we have a chance to talk about what's going on. Isn't there a difference between the uh, uh, EMS flip-flop versus police flip-flop. Indeed. Uh, so if someone calls 911 and they live in the city of Burlington right. and it's determined that they need an ambulance, right? we dispatch the ambulance from our own dispatch center so there's no transfer of the call. We keep the caller with us and work it. Uh, now, there are protocols for the city of Burlington where Burlington Fire will also be dispatched, right? Because most of the time, well, 90% of the time, the fire department get there quick. Right. So they'll get the call, but we'll work the dispatch of the ambulance. So, uh, same thing with the sheriff's department. If the sheriff's department is dispatched to a location in Burlington, the, the dispatch service stays with the county, right? The caller comes in and we say, okay, uh, we're going to have to send the sheriff to that's dispatched from uh, from our seat. County, so. Well, it got down to a debate years ago. They want to put it all on one building, seven million dollars. That was a long time ago. And the debate was with me was which is more important to to uh, to uh, people in Burlington. If you don't mind me on this, code three with the Burlington Police Department, or or to me all EMTs is code three. I mean, you know, it's health related. So which was more important to 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 y'all? Code three is with the Burlington Police Department, which was by new compared to code ones and twos, versus. You know, have to kick back the ambulance switch. Sure. So unless that rule has changed, uh, well, we got to look at all the details. Absolutely, and and we have felt like up to this point that we would be able to at least request the state to help us uh, formulate how consolidation or co-location would happen because the state. My understanding is the state prefers that these dispatch centers be together. They don't. They are not transferring calls. And uh, from what I have understood, the state has made that a priority for the way to spend 911 funds is to construct facilities that facilitate this where, you know, Burlington and the county could be in the same building. Our hope would be uh, to do this at little to no cost to Alamance County. Uh, and so it, again, it's interesting to see it on the front page of the paper, learn about it that way, but I can certainly assure the board that I'll be talking with both managers to see where, we, where they are in that process. Has all this been weighed out? has our long-term plans for the benefits of consolidation, co-location been taken into account as well as the possible risk of the transfer of, uh, of 911 calls for the Graham resident. So Susan, do you have information about how long it's been since we billed them for their share? I am having connectivity um, issues right now getting that information, but as soon as I get it, I will pass that on to the board. We build this fiscal year. It has been billed this fiscal year. We have had four municipalities to have paid their fiscal year 1920 invoice, um, and those payments started coming in in October. Okay, and so, but they, uh, Graham would, had agreed to pay us $130,000. I think that's what you said. Yes, their, their billed share of the CECOM operations is $130,478 for fiscal year 1920. And this article says that they would be paying Burlington $254,000. And then an initial, and also uh, $80,000 uh, equipment to bring in equipment and train new staff. They would be paying that. So 
that makes sense. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting for the Grand City Council Maybe to consider that, if that's what they want to do. Um, it would just be nice if we knew about it before we read about it in the newspaper. Yes, I would agree. So does anybody else have anything for No, thank you for bringing today? that to the attention. Yeah, it's interesting. All right. If there's nothing <coughs> further, then we'll be adjourned. Thanks. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Meetings of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners occur on the first and third Monday of every month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. Typically, the first meeting of the month occurs at 9 a.m. and the second meeting occurs at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting is broadcast on Local Gov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about this schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our website at www.alamance-nc.com or at our YouTube channel. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of the meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about our commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on Local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.